There is a darkness upon the land. It is a time of oppression. The people are under a new rule. The Normans have come. They have brought with them a new way of life, a new language, and the old ways are being lost in the mists of time. But some tales have survived. The people remember. A great hero comes to them from the dark woods. He is the Hooded Man. His memory still shines bright like the May Day sun. If only we could remember. Why? Robin Hood is Merry Men and, of course, Maid Marian, are known the world over. Their exploits have been told and retold thousands of times in movies, books, games and all manner of media. They have even been retold under different guises, with the names, locations and periods altered. But what remains is the archetypal battle of good over evil, of injustice rectified and the sins of man highlighted. These same truths can be found in myths, folklores and traditions all over the world from many periods. The mystery of their meaning still haunts our subconscious state. It lingers within us. The popular perception of the Robin Hood tale in our modern times comes to us from Hollywood movies. Even these are retranslations of a 16th century retelling. It was produced by Anthony Mundy, a contemporary of Shakespeare. As such, it has been altered from its original form, and yet it remains recognizable and retains all those archetypal elements. Robin is a disinherited nobleman who leads his wayward band of outlaws against the Sheriff of Nottingham and his evil doing. The setting is the time of Richard the Lionheart in the late 12th century. Modern tales and films include Maid Marian as Robin's love, with specific outlaws named such as Will Scarlet, Friar Tuck and, of course, Little John. The world of Robin Hood is, to many people's surprise, a hotly debated arena. 
Folklorists point to pagan roots and tales of the green man, fairies and goblins. Historians point to dozens of possible Robins, Roberts, Hoods and Hodes. Sherwood Forest in Nottinghamshire is moved to Yorkshire, Lincolnshire and even Wales in an attempt to gain the spotlight of tourism. Literally thousands of locations across the United Kingdom have Robin Hood linked names, such as Robin Hood's Bay in Yorkshire. Most have no historical basis, however, and could be so named for any number of reasons. But what is the truth? Was there a real Robin Hood? Or was he simply a wood nymph, a figment of our imagination? Or is there a deeper and more profound set of explanations? We must begin by seeking out a real Robin Hood from history. If it is possible to trace the true history of Robin Hood, then we must look towards original texts. Amongst the earliest cited by historians are the York Assizes from 1225, which refer to a Robert Hood. This character was said to be a fugitive tenant of the Archbishop of York. He appears again in 1227 as Hobhot. But is this because he was being given a romantic title rather than using his own name? In 1262, Royal records show that a William Robot had a nickname of Robin Hood, and in all likelihood, Robot was also a title or nickname. In 1266, there are records that a battle raged between the Sheriff of Nottingham and outlaws of Sherwood Forest. In 1304, a Robin Hood is named in Folio 103 of Registrum Premonstratense. In 1316, in the Wakefield Court Rolls, there is a marriage between a Robin Hood and Matilda Hood. In 1323, a Robin Hood is mentioned as a porter to King Edward II, and there are many more as Robin Hood under several forms had rapidly become a common name taken or given to heroes and villains alike. It is what is known as a ballad name. There were in fact no less than eight known prominent Robin Hoods in existence before 1300 and five of those were outlaws. And so tuning into the exact origin is something of a fine art, if not an act of imagination. Some claims to the real Robin, however, have more substance than others. In around 1510, an anonymous poem entitled A Little Jest of Robin Hood appeared in print. Most scholars agree that the language structure of the work points to an origin of the mid to late 14th century, placing it roughly in the time of Edward II and not Richard the Lionheart. In this poem, Robin is a soldier, not a nobleman. He was a knight in the army of Thomas, the Earl of Lancaster, who led a tax rebellion against the crown in 1322. The 
dates and events are real. An official re Joseph Hunter in the mid-19th century in the archives of Wakefield Manor. His name was Robert Hode. We must remember that Robin was a version of Robert, which means bright or shining. And Hode is one of the medieval spellings for Hood. So Robert Hode is indeed a Robin Hood. And he even married a lady by the name of Matilda, which had been an early form of Maid Marian. Matilda joined this leader of the Earl's Outlaws in Sherwood Forest. In the little jest of Robin Hood, we are also told the method of Robin's death. The abbess of Kirkley's Priory in Yorkshire murders him following his attempt to seek refuge in the Priory. There is no explanation for this act, but the date given in the jest for the death of this abbess is 1347, the very same year the real abbess of Kirklees died. However, nobody is suggesting that the jest of Robin Hood is the tale of a real man. In fact, as we shall soon learn, there is more truth in the tale than any literal translation can bestow. There is another character who is the Nottingham contender for the post, the son of the Earl of Huntington. His name was Robert de Kine, and in 1226 he was accused of certain crimes and declared an outlaw. According to some, he changed his name to Robin Hood and disappeared into Sherwood Forest. Henry III and his son Prince Edward journeyed to Sherwood to eliminate the outlaws. Later, in 1272, the Public Records Office patent rolls say that the sheriff waged war on Robin and was paid 100 marks for his effort. However, it may simply be that there is some Nottinghamshire tourist spinning afoot here, as the links are very suspect. It is also a distinct fact that Robert de Kine simply took on the name of a popular folk hero. This was rapidly becoming a kind of propaganda, which itself points towards a much earlier origin. There are, however, many contenders for the role of the real Robin and the choice has very often become subjective to the period and location of the writer. To Saxons in the 13th and 14th centuries, the ideal Robin would have been one who battled the invading Normans and their repressive society. Most people lived lives of destitution as peasants and corruption within the ruling elite was rife. To be called an outlaw was something of an honor amongst the ordinary folk. Little wonder that the name spread to many rebels and that in popular perception Robin became a hero of the poor, or indeed, already was. The fact is that the name was profuse and linked with the role of outlaw. Was it indeed simply a title bestowed and had in fact been something of importance for a long time? Today, there are many folk heroes amongst the ordinary classes who take the hood, or are from the hood. But we do not search for the original man from the hood. It may be that elements of Robin Hood's tale are based on an original person or persons. 
Maybe time and legend have surrounded him to such an extent that we no longer recognize him. The same has been true of many real people. Richard the Lionheart is one real character from history whose legend bears no relation to fact. In our times, we have done the same with our modern hoods, taking such people as Kennedy and glorifying him in popular media. Could it be that the elementary parts of the Robin Hood myth were in fact based upon much deeper human and nature-driven truths? Could there be some truth in the folklorist's idea of Robin as the green man or fairy of the woods? And did these elements find themselves attached to a real character from history? The memory of Robin was so deeply ingrained in the public psyche that the perpetrators of the ill-fated gunpowder plot were named Robin Hoods. Whether this came from sneaking feelings of support from a largely downtrodden populace, or part of a rebellious and traitorous template from the authorities, is not clear. Before we delve into European folklore for our answers, we would do well to examine fables from other parts of the globe. Folklore did not emerge from the ground. It welled up within the mind of man from his observation of life and the world around him. It travelled with him as he migrated around the globe. It is like a constantly moving stream of wisdom that alters course occasionally as it crosses the landscape. And yet, it retains its original substance and fertilises the ground around it, whilst also taking with it some element of the land. In the same way, folklore adds to and takes from the cultures it crosses through. The European culture did not suddenly emerge overnight. For millennia, the tales told by man have been adopted by neighboring cultures and fostered. Europe has been constantly invaded by armies of the East and vice versa. It has traded with continents beyond its boundaries for as long as there have been settlements. But more than products and services were traded. So too were legends, tales, beliefs and language. Our very language is termed Indo-European, giving us a clue to one of those vast influences upon the mind of European man, India. Indo-European languages number over 400 and can be traced back to 2500 BC, around the Balkans, from where it spread outwards west into Europe and east towards India. Proto-Indo-European can be traced back even further to around 7000 BC and reveals an almost global family of man. There would be little wonder then to find the elementary archetypes of the Robin Hood folklore within the tales of many nations. But how striking a resemblance would we require to be convinced that the Hood tales originated a long time before the reign of Edward II? In India, there are tales known as the Ramayana. These are the stories of the adventures of Rama Ahodja, the Hindu human incarnation of Krishna, the great solar divinity. Even his name, Rama, Hodja, sounds like Robin Hood. He was the Lord of Midnight, dwelling in the depths of night and known as the Bright One, just as Robert means bright. He is pictured with the bright hood or halo, words linked together and seen also in the hooded cobra images of India. He was an expert with the bow and arrow, shooting solar fire. 
He was a crown prince unjustly exiled to the forests with his wife Sita. Sita was the daughter of the mother goddess and princess of Mithila, sounding remarkably like Matilda, the prototype for Maid Marian. And just as the Sheriff of Nottingham would abduct Maid Marian, so too Sita was abducted by a king named Ravana. Rama and his band of outlaws deposed the king and his expertise with the bow was a thing of legend. He spent 14 years in the forests and in an amazing coincidence Robin Hood was said to have vexed the northern parts for full 13 years and more. It is a European tradition to understate the number by one or more to add weight and power to the tale. 14 is an important half-moon cycle period in many cultures, and as we shall soon discover, lunar cycles will become very important in understanding the Robin Hood legend. To many historians, such a link would be ridiculed. But with the similarities and origins of archetypal folktales, we actually have here a distinct possibility. As these Hindu tales seem perfectly bizarre to us today, with their tales of monkey gods and strange creatures, so too early forms of the Robin Hood folklore seem peculiar. We have concepts of green men, goblins, and strange deities of the woods, all sounding very close to the Hindu myths. In European lore, we find that elves of the wood were seen with hoods, and that Robin Hood is linked with Robin Goodfellow, otherwise known as Puck or Hob. Goodfellow was a pre-Christian wood sprite or trickster, leading folk astray with his bright light in the dark of night. This may also have links to the tradition of Will-o'-the-Wisp, another trickster spirit that may more likely be a naive reference to marsh gas igniting than randomly flickering in the deep woods. As Puck, he can be traced across the entire European continent and it is believed to be of Proto-Indo-European origin, revealing the ancient nature of this folklore. As Hob, he is the Hobgoblin, and Hob is also interchangeable with Rob, or indeed Hod. Could this be one of the earliest origins of the European Robin Hood? Puck is in fact a European version of the Greek god Pan. He was lord of the animals and nature spirits, and lived in Arcadia. The truth is that across the world, nature spirits and entities of the woods were commonly believed in. They were often tricksters, and yet also kindly, revealing a very human duality. For we are very often faced with ourselves in those dark, wild places. But this is also nature itself, for it knows not good or bad. It just is and our perceptions of it reveal a subjective and divisive nature within us. We view nature and judge it as good or bad. Puck, on the other hand, as a nature spirit, doesn't care for our perceptions. In this respect, Robin Hood has also been linked with the global phenomenon of the green man or wild man of the woods. Depicted inside and outside the churches of Europe, 
the green man has foliage sprouting from within himself and peers through the veil of this otherworldly place. He is within what he is without. This mirrors the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, where Jesus states, When you make the inside like the outside, and the outside like the inside, then you will enter the kingdom of God. One thing is abundantly clear. There is an ancient and deeply fundamental code here. An ancient wisdom that speaks of our connection to nature, stolen by the Christian church that people saw as dividers between themselves and their spiritual surroundings. In the 12th century life of Merlin, we have precisely the same elementary truth as Merlin flees to the woods. He made use of the roots of plants and grasses, of fruit from trees, and of the blackberries in the thicket. He became a man of the woods. He became a man of the woods. This is Merlin, the wise wizard of a time before Christianity, becoming the wild man of the woods, merging with the spirits of the darkness and living as one with nature. The green man is also often termed the horned god, linking him again to Pan. Robin's link with the Horned God is also telling as he is lord and master over the human animals of the forest, and they are guardians of their stolen treasure, like the hoarding serpent Nagas of Hinduism. They do good deeds for those who deserve them, and dastardly deeds to those who do not. This is the truth of Robin Hood, that he guides us back to a place seemingly stolen from us by the invaders. He restores our connection to nature, to our true selves now lost in a material world of lords, barons and earls. Instead of doing the bidding of the elite, fighting wars in far off lands and handing over our crops to the monks, we ought to be one with nature, understanding her cycles read the seasons, respect her as Robin adored Mary. There are elements of the Robin Hood myth that relate to other legends. The Tree of Life is seen as Robin's larder tree, supplying all that could be required, like the Horn of Plenty, or the cauldron of Celtic folklore. This cauldron is guarded by the Horned God yet again. Robin Goodfellow is said to be born of a human mother and a godlike father in the form of Oberon. He is also green, like the green man which is a special healing colour attributed to many things, such as the emerald tablet, the colour of initiation into Gnostic mysteries associated with the Masons, and the green glass of the Grail.
It is believed by many that the crescent shape of the bow recalls the crescent moon and horns of the pagan horned god, as does the horn Robin uses to call his people together. Even Little John, in the tale of Robin Hood and Sir Guy de Gisborne, is tied to a tree, being saved at the last minute by Robin in disguise. Robin is here shape-shifting, just as the legends tell us Robin Goodfellow could. As with most folklore, there is symbolism, myth, legend, and probably some element of a real origin. Robin Hood may well have some aspects of his personality and life in real people, but some historians would steer away from stating anything as fact. As Fran and Jeff Dole point out in their book, Robin Hood, Outlaw or Greenwood Myth, that the origin of Robin Hood was obscure suggests a mythological or folklore origin. What we also find, however, in some of the earlier tales is that Robin Hood and Little John, like Jesus and John the Baptist, were equals. Walter Bauer, in the 15th century, said that Robin Hood, together with Little John and their companies, rose to prominence. This, in itself, points out that both Robin and John were seen to each have their own followers, very much like Jesus and John. They are therefore, and must be, the twins of Gnosticism, like Castor and Pollux, the duality and balance. There were also 12 main outlaws, just as there were 12 disciples. Curiously, the Ballad of Robin Hood's death also has a ritualistic element. There is mystical foreknowledge and ritual banning. There is death by bleeding, which is suspiciously close to the ritualistic deaths of other European and Asiatic green springtime gods and heroes, such as Tammuz, Adonis and Osiris. Sir James Fraser's wonderful opus, The Golden Bough, strongly infers that Dionysus is another such version of the legend. Tammuz, Adonis and Osiris are vegetation gods of greenness. Indeed, Osiris himself in pyramid texts at Saqqara is called the Great Green and often appears green-skinned as a symbol of resurrection and life. The battle between Osiris and Set seems all the more familiar now in the struggle that ensues between Robin and his arch-rival, the Sheriff of Nottingham. Osiris becomes Horus when resurrected, and we find that it is Horus who is protected by the Wajet Snake, the Green Snake. Could it be that the tales of Robin are more ancient than previously believed? Could they really be tales of ancient Egypt and even Sumeria, passed down over millennia and altered by time? The fact remains that Christianity was stomping all over old pagan beliefs rewriting tales 
that had existed for hundreds of years. But, as the Christians were destroying cultural history, there were those who defended it. The Masons of the period in which Robin Hood grew to popularity were hiding their symbols and pagan ideas in the framework and masonry of churches across Europe. Green men sprang up in every sacred Christian place. Strange characters seen hiding in foliage, peeping out like messengers from the past. These peculiar and somewhat disturbing images to modern eyes are none other than the characters from the pagan past. Gods and deities like Hearn the Horned God and many other images of mother goddesses. The truth to the past of man's religious upbringing can still be seen in the stonework of Christian churches and cathedrals, in places like Roslyn Chapel and Litchfield Cathedral. We must also look to the legends, for as we can see the tales of Robin Hood are not only linked to the ancient past, they are also linked inextricably to the tales of Arthur and his search for the Holy Grail. There are instances like those of the Knight Gawain decapitating the Green Giant and mysterious images of a Green Knight. The plays of old, enacted by local people and paraded through streets, have changed titles across time and location. From the St. George play to the Robin Hood and Green Jack. From Wild Man to Green George. The basic story is the same, but the names change. It is now time to turn to Morris dancing. Today it can be observed across Europe and even America, and its origins are hotly debated. Some say it predates Christianity and derives from ancient pagan ritual fertility dances. Others that it found a home in Europe from the Moors of Spain, and this explains the earliest forms where the dancers paint their faces black, and indeed the Moorish name. Whatever the truth, it can trace its history back over five centuries, and the probability of it being much older is great. What is of interest to us in our search for Robin Hood is that Morris dancing today would not be the same without him being involved. The majority of the Morris dancing that involves Robin Hood can be found on May Day and involves Maid Marian, several outlaws, and the hobby horse. We also find the Green Knight himself under the banner these days of the Christian St. George. A clue to the reality of Morris dancing can be found in the dates it is traditionally enacted. These days are always celebrations of special cyclical dates such as Beltane, Samhain, Whitsun and Michaelmas. All these dates, including May Day, were important to pre-Christian peoples. Why? We have to understand the periods of times gone by. These were days of rural folk who relied upon the seasons. They looked to the green gods for the fertility of their crops and livestock. Specific solstices and equinoxes were marked with their own importance. Spring was the birth period winter the death, and yet also gestation within the womb of Mother Earth. Summer was abundance and autumn a time of gathering in the crops. All of these seasons had to be monitored. They were magical times, governed by the gods and goddesses. This is why these green deities and characters were seen as fertility symbols. They told us the time in relation to our need for food and our own birth cycles. 
and no greater a clock was there for telling the time of year than the heavenly host, the sun, moon, and stars in the sky. As the earth spins around, the seasons change, and the position of the planets alter. The sun's position strengthens and weakens, and the moon in her retrograde orbit maps out a 72-year cycle with every degree she moves. All of this has now been finely mapped and measured. But in times gone by, and without the benefit of our modern technology, things were different. The wise ones, or wizards, such as the fabled Merlin, were the ones who measured and ruled. They laid down great stone machines upon the ground to measure the cycles of nature above and below. They aligned their monuments to the solar and lunar deities, and through observation could predict great and subtle changes in the environment. This was the birth of our modern astrology and astronomy, and was based in real-life survival. It was magical for our ancestors to see how the movement of these starry gods affected and influenced the growth of the very things they needed to survive. It was a gift from the heavens. This is more than archetypal. This is survival and was worldwide. This is why so much folklore, myth and legend actually relates back to the seasons and the turning points in time. But what does all this have to do with Robin Hood? From the very earliest of times, Robin is said to have adored the Virgin Mary. And in fact, Marian is just another version of that name, with maid implying virginity. Mary is derived from the word myrrh, meaning water and wisdom, and is related to the moon. She is, in fact, the moon. For it is the moon which affects the movement of our seas, rivers and lakes. How can we be certain that Mary or Marian was the moon? Catholic tradition states that she lived on earth for 72 years, or one degree movement of the moon. They have 10 Hail Marys of seven joys, or 70 Hail Marys in total. They then add a hail to our Father, and one for the Pope, making 72 Hail Marys in total. She is indeed the moon or lunar aspect. In the May Day festivals, she is often the May Queen, wearing white and a crown, symbols of old for the moon and her purity. Robin, on the other hand, is the bright hood, or shining hood. He is the solar deity who adores the moon, because he casts his light in her direction to illuminate her. So too, Rama, the Hindu deity, is the solar deity, cast into the dark place of the woods. From the very earliest of ballads, we have evidence of this. In the 16th century play, The Downfall of Robert, Earl of Huntington, by Anthony Munday, there are definite statements about Robin's role. This youth that leads yon virgin by the hand, as doth the sun the morning richly clad, is our Earl Robert, or your Robin Hood. Here Robin is said to lead the Virgin, or Moon, by the hand as the sun. In many Morris dances, we will find the female or moon and the male or sun danced about by Morris men with their faces blackened like the night sky. But May Day is more important, for here we find the circumambulation of the Maypole.
May Day is Beltane, named after the solar deity Bel. It marks the end of the dark winter and is the cause of much celebration. It was the day when the annual calendar was reset, using the pole and the wisdom of the elders. Humans have been dancing around the Maypole for hundreds if not thousands of years and were probably doing similar things at ancient megalithic structures. They cycle like the planets around this one upright shaft which itself points directly upwards to the pole star. Their intertwining is complex like the planets and they are tied to the pole as the stars are seemingly tied to the earth at the center. The pole is also the great phallus and the excited dance around the pole produces fertility for the land. It was also the sacrificial tree upon which we now find Jesus, Odin and a host of other solar divinities. But these were not necessarily real people. And if they were, then they were simply taking on a title and enacting a play that was older than any modern religion. In a bizarre resonance with Robin Hood, the name Robin is an ancient slang term for penis. Whether or not this is a direct link to the Maypole is arguable. But given the amorphous nature of folklore and real life, it is a very strong possibility. Without paper, computers, TV or radio, our ancestors used other methods of passing on ancient wisdom and knowledge. They used fables, they drew glyphs, built structures, and they danced. The many dances of the world are now almost totally void of this knowledge, but anthropological research in Africa and elsewhere reveals similar meanings to ancient dances. They are and have been recreated annually. But even in the West, certain things have remained, and these are the characters and dates, leaving behind subtle clues to their origins. The Green Man, the symbol of fecundity, was replaced with Robin Hood and the May Queen by Mary, and later Maid Marian. It is, in fact, a perfect memory device. To enable the human mind to retain long-term memory, we must have strong associations. These are generally characters that we shall always remember, and in so doing, we remember what they did. By making these characters enact specific plays at different times of year, we actually create long-term memory of their actions. The problem has come when we assumed in later years that these characters were actually real and not metaphors for something entirely different. Pharaoh enacted the role of the solar divinity in the sky and his queen took on the role of the lunar deity. Pharaoh was Osiris and the queen Isis. The very same has been true of our kings throughout time, as they wear the solar crown of gold. They ritually enact certain roles at certain times of year, passing on sacred knowledge of the movement of the heavens, revealing their ability to rule and measure. Only with this kind of knowledge can we begin to discern the real histories of the world and divide fable from fact. Robin, as the sun-like Osiris, is disinherited or cast down by Set or the Sheriff. He goes into darkness, 
the deep woods. He is joined by the Queen herself. Together they work with their starry band to reclaim what was theirs, the King's crown, the solar power. On May Day, they emerge into the town and all the folk celebrate and reenact the movements of the planets which brought them to this place in time. They remember because they repeat. The cycles of the heavens are recreated on Earth as if enacting some mystical magic to help nature along. In older days, the fertile men and women would dance off into the dark woods and nine months later, children would emerge. These were special children of the gods and, not surprisingly, characters such as Robin Hood and Little John were children of these May festivities. That is, they were the sons of the god and goddess. Later, the church would attempt to ban weddings in May to avoid this pagan connection to the solar and lunar deities. All elements of our ancestors' lives were intermingled with the seasons, measured by the heavens, monitored by the wise, and celebrated by the masses. At the time of Robin's death, which was always predicted, he casts an arrow or ray of sun into the sky which makes a beautiful arc. It lands westward from where he lays, just as the setting sun goes down in the west. These are elementary parts of a much larger astronomical play. The different aspects of Robin, and indeed Maid Marian, are folktale memories of the aspects of the sun and moon. As Horus was the morning sun, so too Robin and the Indian Rama have similar aspects. So too Mary is Isis, Nut, Hathor and numerous other faces of the moon we humans have deified. If we go deeper still, we will find that the various long-standing outlaws are in fact other planets or constellations. They are members and keys in this ancient memory device, as well as elements of the human psyche. Although beware, as many of the outlaws are in fact later additions. And as our ancestors taught us, that which is above is like that which is below then we also have wonderful psychology built into the plays and fables. Robin and Mary are the fire and water, the divine opposites spoken of in many religious traditions. They have to be in balance, respectful of each other and protective. There will always be a Sheriff of Nottingham who will come along and try to steal our wisdom. But we must battle to win her back. Among us, there are light people and dark people, and all must find their own opposites to unite with, just as it is in heaven. The same is true within each of us, personally. Just as the particle that races around the nucleus pulls away from the center, so too do we. But eventually, the particle reaches its boundary and must spiral backwards again towards the heart of its solar system. The same is true of us. We constantly believe that we can survive without the nucleus and wander away from the true center, the true self. But then we feel alone, as if something is missing. 
And so we begin the search again to discover the core of truth. This quantum level reasoning is no different to the wonderful ratios we see all around us, from the atomic level to the galactic level. Observation on the macro reveals the truth about the micro. This was the Gnostic way. Truth by observation and intuition. And these very elements were in fact fostered and built upon in the early medieval by groups of troubadours. It is claimed that these wandering minstrels, just like Will Scarlet or Alan Adale, were fully conversant with old Gnostic concepts. They produced poems and songs, much like the Song of Solomon, which speaks of the love between man and woman, and yet was in truth speaking of much deeper elements. In this way, they could hide their so-called heresy from the church. One tale that emerged in the 13th century was Robin and Marion by Adam de la Hall. Remarkably, Robin Hood scholars have utterly denied any link between this play with Robin and Marion in the title and our Robin Hood. But now we have a slightly different perspective. What is our conclusion? Well, we know that Marion or Mary was the moon. In mythology, this is the shepherdess. Lo and behold, Marion in this play is exactly that. Her friend is Robin, and there is a tempter knight who tries to seduce her, just as the Sheriff of Nottingham abducts Marion. There isn't much more to the play. It simply shows the divisions between classes and yet reveals Marion to be more than a match for the knight. Wisdom, it seems, overcomes. So what can we conclude from our search as Hollywood continues to remake this ancient folktale? It seems that the concepts hidden within the tales of Robin Hood are very ancient and archetypal indeed. They can be seen in places as diverse as Egypt and India. They can be spotted in the Gnostic Gospels and other folklore such as those of Arthur and Guinevere, Solom and Sheba and Jesus and Mary Magdalene. They have been laid down by those wizards of the past who wish to maintain the knowledge through many means. Eventually Real characters emerged who were attributed titles such as Caesar, King, Tsar, Rex, and possibly Robin. As time went by, the tales of their real deeds merged with those of a more esoteric origin. Just as the Christian church tried to stamp out pagan beliefs by building on sacred sites, they also stamped their Christian tales onto pagan fables. But by doing so, they actually kept them alive. The lives of real people and the imagination of later writers eventually clouded the original elementary archetypal truth of the Robin Hood legend. Now we can look back and unpick the harm that was done and see the elementary bigger pictures which lie beneath. What we see are visions of a past culture that was in awe of the universe around it. They were guided by the movements of their star gods, and they gave them names and humanized them. They then brought them down to earth, dressed them up in all manner of ways, and created mystical characters later adopted by real people. There is still much to learn from the history and mythology of mankind. We can learn about ourselves and our place in the universe. The big question is this. 
Why did we forget? Strength to light your. 